<laughs> All right, it's eight. You ready? Are we ready? Okay, we're good. Go for it. All righty. Going live. Hey, y'all. I'm James Wright, and welcome to the shop. And today we've got Shannon Rogers here with us uh, from uh, Renaissance Woodworking. And uh, we are going to have a, a good bit of fun. So um, just a, a couple notes about upcoming things. Um, next week, we may or may not be having a live. Um, play that by ear and watch the uh, the socials because my wife and I, well, the whole family is going to be gone. Uh, but we might be doing it Monday night, so stay tuned. Um, it should be a fun one if we can do it. Uh, but, but tonight, we have uh, Shan Rogers with us. And uh, we're going to be doing our normal monthly uh, hangout. So, uh, Shan, why don't you introduce us? Uh, introduce yourself. What do you do? Uh, why do you do it? Easy for you to say. <laughs> I think... I think personally you should do a live next week anyway, even if you're not there. Just turn the camera on, leave a light on in the shop. People people will tune in, I guarantee you. Just based on the number of people that, that will ask about things in the background of my shop that have nothing to do with what I'm actually saying yes. to the camera, tells me people spend more time looking at what's behind you than they do actually looking at you. So just turn the camera on and you know, go out for the night. You'll be fine, It'll be perfect. I like it. Anyway, yeah, um, I'm Our Shannon point. Rogers. I, run this site called the Renaissance Woodworker, um, had a YouTube channel by the same name for, I don't know how old YouTube, that long, um, <laughs> plus a couple of years. Uh, run a site called the Hand Tool School as well. It's pretty much where I spend most of my time uh, these days is teaching people hand tool stuff. Um, handtoolschool.net is the site for that. Uh, what else? Uh, I've got a couple podcasts I do. One's called Wood Talk, another one's called the Lumber Industry Update. And on top of that, I am the director of marketing for a lumber company uh, by day. So yeah, all about wood. I deal in, in wood, fair yeah, amount of wood, you know. whether working it by hand or selling wood. Um, that's what I do. So yeah, and now I'm here. So cool. use me. So um, for those of you who don't know, um, Shannon is probably the largest influence on my hand tool um, journey. So uh, when it's I, all my fault. <laughs> when I switched over from power tools to hand tools, um, the hand tool school and uh, a lot of the, the YouTube that he was doing was um, probably my biggest inspiration slash um, education. So thank you. Pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I like Without to hear Without this that. guy, this channel wouldn't be here. So right on. Look at that. That's awesome. <laughs> really kind of cool to hear that. Yeah, it is. It's kind of funny how quickly um, things snowballed. Um, you know, it was it was this very very small community. Um, of course, this was prior to YouTube. You know, we had things like UStream, and most of us were publishing uh, via a platform called Blip TV because Apple was it. Like the the goal was to get you know listed in the Apple podcast archives that that, that or podcast catalog. None of this other stuff really existed. And then YouTube came around and and there was just this explosion. Actually, no, it was relatively quiet for a couple of years. And then it just exploded. And now there's there's so much content. I can't can't keep up with it. I haven't been able to keep up with it for several years. So it's just kind of neat. Now there's just so many different people, so many different points of view, so many different inspiration points to pull from it all. It's, it's pretty exciting to see that. And it's nice to not be just like three guys. <laughs> you know, Matt Vandalist, Mark Spagnuolo, myself, you know, going back, Tommy, Tommy McDonald back in his early days oh. before he had a podcast um, or when he had a podcast, I should say, before he had a TV show. And that was that was kind of it. And, you know, that whole echo chamber idea of just the same people saying stuff over and over again. So I definitely think the explosion has been fantastic and it's allowed us to kind of focus on our own little niche if you will or niche within the niche within a niche you know yeah. as if woodworking wasn't niche enough hand tool woodworking is even more niche and then you get into like you know james you love to restore tools i hate to restore tools <laughs> so it's like thank goodness you know because uh, i got so many people saying you know can you do a video on restoring an old jack plane i was like oh, i don't want to do that you know now i got now i can point to you you know, we got guys like like Rex Kruger, who are, is loved to dive into building all these various and sundry Christopher Schwartz workbenches. And the last thing I want to do is build another workbench. <laughs> I built four of them. I'm done. You know, so it's kind of neat to be able to to point to that. Um, but what's really kind of I don't know, eye opening, I guess, is how we've kind of come full circle, where so much of the stuff that 
that that I did, and even people that have been at this a lot, you know, shorter time than I uh, have, are, I feel like we're repeating ourselves. It's like, oh, I covered that once already, or I did this video on that once already, and, you know, because of just the churn that is the, you know, YouTube and Instagram and everything, a video you did five years ago is completely yeah. irrelevant. You know, even though the techniques I show in it are thousands of years old, you kind of have to do it again. And I'm I'm finding like these huge numbers of people who are tapping into my earlier videos in all of their tw 320p glory, you know, <laughs> in that beautiful like early 2000s low res and picking up techniques from then, you know, which is kind of cool to see. Uh, it does remind me that I should probably go back and shoot some of those videos again, even though I already did it. Um, you know, do it in, in 1080 or at least 4K would certainly be uh, worthwhile. Yeah. So um, here's the big question I've got to ask you, and this is the one thing that kind of drives me and my channel is why do you do what you do? What is your passion? So um, the, the question is, what drives you? What is the thing that makes you excited? What's the thing that you, you start to get jittery about when you think about, ooh, I get to do this? What is that? <laughs> Well, it's interesting because uh, that that answer has changed a fair bit. Um, these days, honestly, it's teaching. Um, that's the the part that that gets me into the shop. You know, th there will be projects certainly um, that I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get back to work on you know whatever that is. But ninety, probably ninety five percent of what I do these days is not really a project, and it's more of showing a particular technique or you know, talking about a particular aspect of, you know, a bit of joinery or part of a project or design. Um, and it's not even, and, and it took me a, a while to think about this because I, I would, I think I kind of hit like a personal slump in the shop. Like I didn't really have any projects going and it was kind of like, you know, getting up the motivation to get in the shop wasn't quite there. And it occurred to me it's because I wasn't driven by want to go build X, but I wanted to, I wanted to teach and more importantly, I wanted to teach things that people wanted to learn, which I know sounds kind of obvious, but, um, you know, rather than putting out a video on, you know, another video on dovetails, what is it specifically that somebody is struggling with, with dovetails? And that's, that's really why I think I've, I've become really happy with the hand tool school because it is just, that's all it is. It's just an opportunity for me to, to address very specific issues that actual woodworkers are having. And, that that's what's exciting to me um spreading the the addiction <laughs> that i've found in hand tools and you know dispelling the myths that hand tools are what so many people think they are that that they're slow or you know antiquated or or all name name the the misconceptions out there and when i can see someone who like the light bulb comes on with sawing. I mean, sawing is my, my hot button. That's the thing that I, I feel like that's where my skill is the strongest, um, not only in actually doing it, but also in teaching it. And when I see somebody, it finally clicks and they saw right to a line and they cut that mortise and tenon in you know, a quarter of the time it took them to cut it before because they weren't spending a whole bunch of time tuning the joint with various and sundry chisels and planes and just getting the joint to fit right off the saw that's awesome. That's the, that's the thing that really kind of drives me. Part B to that answer, um, not to sound like I'm horribly noble and all I want to do is teach the world is part B is, is um, getting a chance to really dive into the obscurities of hand tools. Um, lately, it's been marquetry. Um, when I launched the Renaissance Woodworker more than 10 years ago, the idea was you know, I want to build chairs. No, I want to build cabinets. And oh, now I want to play with veneer and I want to build boxes. And it was like, I wanted to experience everything. You know, I, I couldn't just decide on one particular course or one particular style. I wanted to kind of taste a little bit of everything, be the true Renaissance man when it came to, to woodworking. And that is never been more true than it is today. Um, but kind of taking the opportunity to just let myself fall down a rabbit hole and go as deep as possible and not really worry about, um, is this, you know, unappealing to a certain subset or, or um, am, I, am I taking this a little too seriously and getting a little too esoteric as I dive through, you know, dust covered tomes of 
17th and 18th century marker, marketry techniques, you know, that's, that's the cool part um, is, is being able to kind of in, embrace that rabbit hole, if you will, yeah. um, and just keep going further and further down it. And that may change in three years. You know, I've spent a good two and a half to three years on the marketry thing right now. Um, and that's really, really cool. Um, I want to get back to Windsor's at some point. So that may be the next one that, that I fall down. I shouldn't say, cause I've built, I don't know, six or seven Windsor's at this point, but you know, so much has, has developed, um, with, with, you know, staked furniture and Windsor chairs. And you've got great luminaries out there that have really opened teaching that didn't exist five years ago. So yeah, that type of stuff, being able to kind of indulge in those really specific um, techniques and styles and things like that. So yeah, long winded answer. I think I found you when you just started down the, uh, the turning hole. And that was a that was yeah. a fun one to watch. <laughs> yeah, five five foot power lathes later. <laughs> yeah, now now I have a lathe in practically every room in the house and one in the backyard. So <laughs> yes, yeah, it's great. It worked out well. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, um, if if you're at all interested in learning anything about hand tools, usually one of the first places I tell people to go is the handtoolschool.net. Um, because it is, I mean, it used to be that it was just like you had the, the, the semesters where, you know, the intro and turning mm -hmm. and carving, and you'd have a whole semester on that. But now he has a whole bunch of sections where you can have bits and pieces of there's something specific you want to learn. And it yeah. is the most detailed and beautifully put together information. So, yeah. And I think, you know, more of, I mean, I always knew that the semester idea had a certain lifespan because you know semester 27 you know what, what are we covering <laughs> there you know and the idea was is to to have a structured curriculum which is what those semesters do that have kind of a theme and and really i mean there, there are technically eight semesters now two of them are unnumbered orientation and what i call the first project semester but i mean if you were to go through those your base of knowledge will truly allow you to build everything uh, anything and everything yeah. that comes your way, you can do that. I do plan to produce more semesters where there's kind of a guiding theme, but I, I'm that's where the rabbit hole thing comes in. You know, the the semester on the Queen Anne style, you know, or um, a, a semester on finishing alone um, is is in the works. Uh, when are you I plan to Japanese work through page? the styles. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> Asian woodworking in general is something that I just touched the surface of and kind of kept at arm's length because it's like, I love my Western saws. <laughs> it's the last <laughs> thing I need is an excuse to bring in a bunch more saws. But eventually, you know, playing with Japanese joinery um, and, and how and why it's used, um, those will be the things that will that will happen in the future. Um, timber framing, you know, one of these days, I'm going to go ahead and build my new shop and yeah. pff, that's going to be a semester, you know? So those types of things will be coming, but since the hand tool school, really primarily it's a subscription service. It's like Netflix, you know, um, I call it apprenticeship. Um, it's, it's a you know, recurring fee and you basically have access to the entire site. And what that's allowed me to do is, is that teaching I was talking about before. If an apprentice comes to me and says, I'm struggling with, you know, full blind dovetails, okay we'll do a video on full blind dovetails and we'll talk about full blind dovetails and how they're, why you would use them, you know, and here's how you cut them. And here's the, another way that you can cut them. Um, and that to me is what's kind of cooler is then it just starts to add to the library so that, um, you know, somebody says, Hey, I, I want to learn how to cut the foxtail wedge joint. And I go, Oh yeah, I've got a video for that. That's kind of the joke in the hand tool school community now is, oh, Shannon's got a video for that because nine times out of 10, yeah. I do. I mean, the school's 12 years old. <laughs> I've been producing, you know, on average four new lessons a month um, for at least the last 10 years. So yeah, it uh, starts to add up certainly. Yeah. So for those of you watching, um, if you want any questions for Shannon, go ahead and throw those in the chat. Sarah is there to, uh, to pull them out. And yeah, really please. Enough March self, those here in you know, promotion here. Let's <laughs> talk some woodworking. It's one of the things I still haven't gotten any better at. And it's funny because my day job is in marketing. I am terrible at marketing myself. Like I still continue to get like embarrassed talking about the stuff, you know, my paid products. And it, it goes back to the early days of the internet. Like you did not sell on the internet. Yeah. Um, 
I was actually just having this conversation um, actually with, with Rex Kruger uh, this afternoon about uh, like Patreon and the whole Patreon evolution and people launching podcasts with the Patreon account. And I was like, don't you have to at least have 50 episodes before you can ask for money? <laughs> I'm old fashioned in my thinking, I guess. So yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about some woodworking. What, what, or put me to work for that yeah. matter. Uh, actually, I have a, a, a bit of a discussion on that. Um, one thing that was happening in our high mind is the whole discussion between what percentage of the standard shop work does the average person produce things that do not go in the shop? In other words, not hmm. producing a bench or tool storage or jigs. Um, and it was actually an interesting topic because there were there were several people in the group that said, well, I've been woodworking for three or four years and I've never built a single thing that didn't go in the shop. Zero <laughs> percent leave the shop, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that's pretty common though. Um, and actually, oh, here I go, self-promoting again. Um, my first project semester that I released that uh, last November, that was the whole idea. It's like, guys, you've been working in the shop. Like your, your, your boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, whatever is like, what are you doing down there? Here's a semester where you can build things that actually leave the shop. Like that can <laughs> prove that you're actually learning something down there. And this skill that you're spending all this time in can actually produce something like that coffee table that someone wants. I, yeah, I, I wonder like if you were to graph that, you know, percentage of stuff that leaves the shop, graph it over time, how much it would actually change. Um, and I don't think it would change that much to tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, maybe it would get to a point like when you hit that 10, maybe 15 year mark as a woodworker, it's probably going to change maybe. Um, but I still find myself building stuff for the shop and I've been woodworking 20 years, maybe, I don't know, longer than 15. And you know, it's, you're working on a project and you realize this is an inefficient way to do this, or this appliance is, you know, was cobbled together and it's literally double stick taped together. I got to do something about that, you know, <laughs> and, you, and you stop what you're doing and you make a better bench hook or a better yeah. shooting board. Uh, just the other day, I made a, a supplemental um, table to go on my, uh, my bird's mouth, my fret sewing fixture that would work better for marquetry because I kept um, dropping little pieces through the hole. I was like, this is ridiculous. I need, excuse the power tool term, I need a zero clearance insert <laughs> for my, my bird's mouth fixture. And, you know, I could have just slapped a piece of plywood on and like clamped it in place, but no, it had to have integral fences and had to have all this other stuff because I figured I might as well make it right, you know? So yeah, I do think there's an element of that that never goes away, yeah. um, but it would be curious to see where is that, that, you know, inversion point in the graph where suddenly stuff just starts to leave the shop all the time. I don't know. See, I one of the interesting things we were talking about is that uh, when I, I, I just put out a video this week on upgrades to my bench, um, and I had like five or six upgrades I wanted to do. I wanted to move my swing out seat from one side to the other. I wanted to drill a couple of dog holes, but there were the type of things that I never would take the time to stop and do because I was right. producing things. Right. But you in have order to make, to make those, I had to make a video about them. <laughs> That would right. then give me a reason to make them all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Same reason that I have one of those bench crafted swing out seat kits that is still in a box somewhere um, in, in the shop. <laughs> um, one of these days I'll get to it. But you know, I could I could build a swing out seat or I could sit on this perch stool that I built, you know. Yeah. So I'd much rather this is a heck of a lot more comfortable. So it's, I, I haven't I haven't gotten around to building that yet. Um, I have a miter jack that I've wanted to build for eight years um, and I was building a, a particularly chunky picture frame the other day that would not fit on any of the shooting boards I have um, because it was just too wide. You know, the, the plane itself, there is no plane with the blade <laughs> wide enough to tackle this. And, you know, I, I did it freehand. Um, it's one of my, my mantras in the hand tool school is learning to do it the hard way. Because one of these days that jig is not going to work, yeah. you know. It's it's the whole idea with with learning to plane a board by hand. You know, you may have a power joiner, you may have a power planer, but one day you're going to have a board that's too wide for that joiner and too wide for that planer. Um, sitting next to me is a 26 inch wide piece of walnut that, even though I have a 20 inch planer, 26 is bigger than 20. So if I didn't know how to plane it by hand, I would have to to do it. So um, I ran into this really chunky picture frame. 
And, you know, I had to lay out the miters and, and use a block plane and, and sit there with my, my 45 degree square and check it after every pass. And kept thinking, man, this would have been a great time to have that miter jack. <laughs> and that sure enough, got me to pull it off the shelf and take a look at the plans and, you know, okay, Nanny, now I need to build this thing because you know, I may never build a picture frame like that again, but dang it, there's a need. I need got to build it. it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what questions we got, babe? Uh, let's see. I don't know if it's pronounced Jokovi. Um, <laughs> hand tool dual. Which tool do you choose? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to we have to clarify. Is the hand tool dual to the death or to the production of a project? It's merely a flesh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like pain. me versus James type dual? Like you know, Spartacus <laughs> in the in the ring? Like. <laughs> Because oh. usually it's you know it's it's the half inch chisel that's that's the tool. I knew what yours was going to be. <laughs> I knew what yours was going to be. No, no, it's got to be the sash saw in my case. And uh, that's what they said in the chat. <laughs> they know it's, you. <laughs> if it's to the death, then it, it's then it's the hatchet. You know, that's the. <laughs> hmm. It's the tool that gets the yeah. most done really quickly. <laughs> I got the tool for the death match. Do you think it'll hack it? Uh -oh. You bring your hatchet, uh -oh. I will bring my gutter axe. <laughs> yes. I think the reach alone ought to, uh, yeah. And it's an Osage George handle, so it's got that little bit of extra whip in the swing. That, yeah, that's enough to crunch bones and skulls. And it's dusty, you gotta fix that. Yeah. At this point, do I say, well, that accelerated quickly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, it would have to be some sort of swung tool in order to be to the to the death. Yes. If I was building a project, it would definitely be the sash saw. So what else we got, babe? Uh, let's see. Seth um, Fontanet asked, if you could only have one saw for the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, that's... An eight-point per inch crosscut. Full-size, 26-inch. Eight PPI saw. It might be a little fine, but you could deal with it. Yeah, I mean, it would probably. In do. a zombie apocalypse, I would have to go with a hatchet. But you know, <laughs> you know my, as long my, as I could continue to get sawn lumber, it would be the crosscut saw. My my gut reaction would be like ten point crosscut sash saw or a, a, a carcass saw. You know that's um, the wrong answer. But. What? Yeah, but you with the saw. Oh, yeah, the, the saw would be my wife. <laughs> yes. Her initials are S A W. I was going to say, <laughs> man. Very nice. Well, Very the, nice. you know, the carcass saw is what I use more than anything else for just simple joinery. But. Yeah, but how are you going to break your boards down to size? Yeah, no, that, that's, the, that's the thing. I mean, yeah, you can always do it with other things, but. And you can I mean, cut joinery with go, hand you saw. You can always do smaller things with the bigger saw, but you can't always do bigger things with the smaller saw. <laughs> I have cross-cut boards with a carcass saw. Um, <laughs> it works. It's not, it's not efficient. And also, you know, th there's an efficiency thing as far as like how fast you get yeah. it done. But I'm also the firm believer that we are the weakest link in the shop. Oh, yeah. You know, the errors that happen are error, error between saw and stool. Um, it's it's this meat sack yeah. that causes the problems. You know, assuming your saw is well tuned, the saw is going to cut straight. I'm the one that makes it cut crooked. So the more saw strokes I have to take, the more chances there are for me to screw things up. So the the efficiency for me is taking this idiot out of the equation. So if I have a coarser pitch saw, I have to take fewer saw strokes in order to make that cut, which means there's greater chances of it coming out accurately. Yeah. Especially if you if you get to the point where you have a, a thinner set and you're getting a cleaner cut, even with a larger tooth, you can get a lot done really fast. Well, and just stylistically wise, um, I don't know if that's a phrase or not. Stylistically wise, you know, we 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 talk about um, the perfectionism that is modern woodworking. And <laughs> you look at you look at guys like Cosman that produce just museum. I even I hate to say museum quality dovetails because museum quality dovetails are much worse <laughs> yes. than what Cosman produces. Museum quality dovetails are ugly by modern standards, and this this perfectionism that has become 
you know, what is expected of us as modern woodworkers is just kind of silly. So mm -hmm. I think if we got to a point where we were all forced to choose that one tool, it'd be funny how our standards would change and how saws I think would end up winning the day because it would be become acceptable not to have that smooth plain surface visible anymore. We'd go back to, you know, every man furniture of the 18th century and 17th century that was cut using nothing but a hatchet, frankly. Um, and it's only now that, you know, we have this stigma attached to a sawn surface um, or a stigma attached to a tiny little gap in a ducktail. you know, it has to be, looks like it was grown that way. Um, and I have yet to see a priceless museum piece that has dovetails that look like that or yeah. you know a case side with a big old crack down the middle because it expanded you know and it was locked into place because whoever built it didn't think about wood movement or you know, it's not that they didn't know about it they just didn't care because they weren't concerned about building a piece of furniture that would last 100 years they were concerned about building a piece of furniture that their customer wanted yeah and you know if if it cracks in 10 years they'll come and get another one from me so yeah it's just funny how our kind of ideas have changed you know we're, we're as woodworkers we're so concerned about our legacy it seems like am i going to build this heirloom yes. piece of furniture that's going to last 50 years i'm not saying build crap it's going to fall apart in a year but you know 50 100 years from now sure it's going to be nice if you have something to hand down but um let's not go overboard here the hatred of pocket holes <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's it is funny, you know, I, I had got rid of all of my power tools. I still have a few. I've got my power planer. I have a track saw. Um, it actually doesn't live in the shop. I kept it specifically for like home improvement type projects. And I have a Craig pocket hole jig set because that thing is fantastic when you want to like knock together a cabinet really quick or if you're doing built in bookshelves or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic for that. Why would I want to do something else? You know, I could I could cut a bunch of dados and rabbits and, and make, you know, a fancy case or I could pocket screw it together and be done, you know, in an afternoon and get back to the shop and work on marketry, which is what I really want to do. <laughs> what we got, babe? Um, well, you got a super chat from Tom Lurkin. Hey, thanks, Tom. So are you ready for the mom joke? Oh, yes. What's the mom joke? Do you know what um, you know that gravity is the most one of the most fundamental sources in the universe? But do you know what you get if you remove it? What? Gravy. Gravy? Grab it. Too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that one today. He who laughs last usually had to have it explained. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Well, we had a tongue in cheek question from Worth the Effort. So Shannon, get out of here, Sean. <laughs> what? So, I just like the question. With your love of the minuscule info and autistic level of Latin retention and species info, have you figured out what mental illness fuels us woodworkers to create artisanal hamster bedding? <laughs> <laughs> that still hasn't gotten old. I can remember like 10, 12 years ago, people posting pictures of the gossamer thin shavings they made and I saw the same thing on Instagram today. Like nothing has changed. People are still posting pictures of piles of shavings. And it's like, what were you working on? Oh, this is over here, but here's these shavings I made, yes. you know? And, and then even, even trendier is like the big thick shavings. It used to be the gossamer see-through shavings that posted pictures. Now people want to show, you know, how much they hogged off with their scrub plane or their four plane, <laughs> or look at what I did with my, you know, spoon carving knife or this ads that I just got, you know, just so funny. I don't know what that illness is that causes it to focus on that. I think it's the, uh, it's the, the caveman in all of us that says, you know, must swing sharp tool, make shaving, That's know, a which also make fire. Good fire. Good. Uh, a friend of mine who teaches, um, he teaches sharpening at one of the uh, woodcraft stores. And uh, at the end of the old one, he used to take the chisel and, you know, slice a piece of paper and people would be like, yeah, whatever. But then you take that same chisel and put it on a, uh, um, a full ream of paper and slice the corner all the way down the paper and people would be like, <gasps> it was like, it's the exact same thing. <laughs> right. But can it cut a Coke can in half? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and still perfectly slice your tomatoes when you're done. You know, <laughs> that's the true test right there. What's next, babe? And not only do you get that, but you'll get. <laughs> so Matt Tama wants to know, what woods do you like to build things from the most? <laughs> I think we already know James's answer on that one. <laughs> Whatever woods in the shop. <laughs> what about oh. you? Choosing, choosing a wood, that's just mean. Um, <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. Um, I like to work with wood. Now, um, probably walnut. Uh, man, see, I say that and then I think, ooh, but soft maple's fun too. Um, recently, hickory, I really, or uh, not hickory, um, chestnut, really loved working with that. Um, you know, I keep coming back to walnut. Um, it's just, it's a, fantastic wood to work by hand of course it's gorgeous unfortunately it's rather expensive especially these days it's very expensive but um yeah uh you know the the really the really hard stuff when you get into hard maples and most of the exotics um perfectly workable by hand but just not really my cup of tea um i like straight grain i like boring straight grain so as rift uh, or as quartered as it can be is what I like. Um, and like the open grain stuff that I find in a lot of oaks um, doesn't really suit my style. If I work with it, I end up pour filling it <laughs> and making it look like, you know, a, a, a diffuse pour wood. Um, so yeah, if I had to choose one, it would probably be walnut. See, I, I, I don't like, um, I don't like maple and a lot of the exotic hardwoods just because they, they're more work without mm. the benefit. Yeah, but you agreed. get like quarter sawn white oak. It's a lot of work, but it's worth the benefit. And that's, I think that's where, yeah. where it falls for me. Well, that's the other thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is people, you know, there's a lot of people who, who don't like oak and they're referring to red oak. Yeah. Like white Flat oak is a joy to work. <laughs> yeah. White oak is a totally different beast than red oak. Um, it's, it's an absolute joy to work. Um, it's hard. But it's not, I mean, it's, it's, you know, pretty much as hard as hard maple. It's not quite as hard as hard maple, but it works it's half as easily than... as hard maple. Yeah. You know, I'm pulling that number out of nowhere, but it's so much more pleasant to work with than hard maple. Um, and, and it's interesting, right? You know, I know what you're talking about, James, like very little reward in maple. Maple's great. Like if you specifically want to dye it, like if you're looking <laughs> for, you know, a blank slate that you can go with. And if you're really just looking for something that's white, go with something like holly. Holly is a joy oh, yeah. to work with. Kind of difficult to find, but you know, for the right project, it's worth it. Absolutely. Cool. What's next? Let's see. Hansonomics asks, does it make sense to specialize in one type of wood when crafting? We kind of just... I wouldn't think there's anything particular to one type of wood. I think it'd be better to be multiple. What would you say? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, it was one of the things that uh, James alluded to my, my turning rabbit hole earlier. It was one of the things that turning was really good for is it allowed me to explore a lot of different woods. Because mm. I was, you know, I was getting very small blanks, like, you know, bottle stopper blanks or, or small spindle type things. And it allowed me to, to you know, play with Bocote and, and, you know, Macassar Ebony and Zeracote and you name them and got a really, really strong understanding of the structure of wood. Mm. If you work with one species, you're, the benefit is you're going to get really good at anticipating how it's going to work. Um, you're going to get a feel for how it chops, how it planes, how it saws and be able to read the grain particularly well, because every species is going to have its kind of eccentricities. But there's always going to be that one, say it's cherry, you specialize in. There's always going to be that one piece of cherry that completely throws you for a loop. You know? <laughs> yes. So all that learning that you just did on cherry means zip on that particular board. But if you've worked with white oak and red oak and maple and cherry and walnut, and then you're working with that weird cherry board, you go, oh, you know what? This is working a little bit more like walnut, or this is starting to behave like hard maple around this knot. And here's what I learned when I work with hard maple. Yeah. Um, so yeah, specializing in that one species is gonna be 
fine to a point. Um, and wood is organic. So the one thing you can count on is that every board is going to be different. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I've gotten a similar question um, into the, the Lumber Update podcast just about like, how did you learn about wood? Like, where do I start? You know, more often it's not, it's what book can I read? And it's like, you know, yeah. here are 12 books, read those then spend a bunch of time working 20 different species. I mean, that's that's how you're going to learn a lot about wood is by working a bunch of different species. Moreover, it's just fun. Mm -hmm. It's really cool to explore the different colors and, and figures and grains. One of the things that's been really fun about marquetry is because I get to play with veneer. Like I never would be able to work with Tamo ash <laughs> any other way, you know, than in veneer form. Now, granted, I'm, it's different working. You know, I'm not working with solid wood. It's sawing it is, is pretty much the same for one veneer to the next but the ability to play with those different colors and grains and compose is, is just not something you can do with a single species uh, along that that same line um a common question is you know what's the best wood to learn on or you know hmm. what's the best wood to learn this particular topic and yes i like to answer with it depends on you if you're the hmm. type of person who gets frustrated early easily and walks away Here's an easy wood to learn on. But if yeah. you're the type of person like me who's just really stubborn and learns by bashing your head against a wall until suddenly it clicks, Literally. then here's something really difficult because once you do this difficult thing, then these other ones will make more sense. Seriously, that kind of defines your first couple of years on YouTube. Just firewood oak. <laughs> yes. Oak from the firewood pile. It's, it's wood by right. It's the firewood pile show. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about some nasty wood to work. Just gnarly, but man, you learned a lot, right? About grain and, and how it all works and the structure of wood. So yeah, there's, there's a point, you know, in um, uh, a lot of like the shop appliance type stuff that like I build in the hand tool school, I get that question, like what wood should I use? And, and I'll say, look, you know, there are some easier woods, like you said, James, that won't frustrate you. But then there's the other aspect that like, I have bench hooks that I built 12 years ago that I'm still using one of which is made out of white oak with a zero cote fence. It's just beautiful. Um, was it harder to put a zero cote fence than a poplar fence? Absolutely. Was it harder to make a white oak bed than a poplar one? Absolutely. But it's a beautiful bench hook that I still enjoy working on to this day. It was worth, Sean's still in the chat room. It was worth the effort to, uh, <laughs> to build it out of white oak and zero cote. I have one also made out of poplar. Um, yeah, it's all right, you know not as pretty there's something about picking up that uh you know that one tool that you spent a bit of time on that drove you nuts but when it's done it's just it's gorgeous and it makes you mm -hmm. feel good to use it oh yeah we've all got them you ever worked with grenadillo uh -uh. it is devil weed awful <laughs> awful stuff to work with but man this veneer hammer i'm very proud of this veneer hammer this came out of a solid block a six by six by 18 inch block of Grenadillo, um, which I still have quite a bit of, but this was a uh, fun project. Okay, can I ask a question for yeah. myself? Because mm -hmm. I'm very naive to, I mean, I've learned a lot with the lives, but you keep saying market tree. What is that? Um, market tree is- We have a wide range of viewers, so maybe I'm not the only one that does Think about that furniture you would see in a French mansion. Because I go there every day. <laughs> <laughs> you could just say it's so, a style. It doesn't have to be. I'm just. Marquetry is, in essence, painting in wood, painting with wood, I should say. You're creating a picture out of a series of veneers. Um, and something can be very, very simple, like, you know, the classic yin yang symbol. This is marquetry. This marquetry is then inlaid into solid wood. So the maple is a thin veneer of maple, and then the walnut is a thin veneer of walnut, and then I've got the same thing. So this, this marquetry design here is like a tenth of an inch thick. Um, I then took that design and inlaid it into solid wood. So there's marquetry, and then there's inlay. Um, you can get more complex. Here's a, a logo of, of the, my, my day job, the Jacobs and McElvain company. This is marquetry. Um, we've got Bubinga and holly and quilted maple and curly maple. And if you look, you can see, you know, we, we've got kind of that three dimensional. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't see because I'm blocking my own camera. <laughs> um, and then the whole thing is then set on top of a walnut 
backer. This is actually the backer, the walnut doesn't matter. This is just to, to stiffen the whole thing up. So this in its basic form is, is marquetry. You can get really elaborate, you know, self portraits and, you know, the, the finest Leonardo da Vinci painting from the Renaissance, people have done it in marquetry. Um, and generally marquetry tends to be um, like the entire surface. So like this cabinet door would enti the entire front surface would be veneered, but that veneer would have a marquetry pattern in it and you would cover the entire surface in it. So when you look at 18th century um, French marquetry furniture, uh, Louis XIV furniture is what is generally called Louis XIV. Um, it is nothing but veneer. The entire surface is veneer, but it's really, really intricate designs from floral designs to geometric designs, which would technically be called parquetry. Think of parquet flooring, um, where you may have a series of interlocking um, diamond patterns or think of a, like a backgammon board. Backgammon board is parquetry. A chessboard is parquetry, um, assuming you're using veneer to lay it down. Marquetry has to be veneer. Um, the thicker stuff is when you get into things like intarsia and inlay. So that's the one defining characteristic is, is marketer will always be veneer. It's cut using, you know, a fret saw um, or a marketry de Chevalet, which is that thing over in the dark there. Um, that's a marketry horse. It's based on a um, 17th century uh, French design. So yeah, it's painting in wood. <laughs> Should have just stopped there. Well, I learned something new, so I don't know if I've ever did, but I did. Um, Good. You, do, you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't do marquetry. Uh, yeah. I've, I've done a few forays into it, but not anything like that. Yeah. You're, car yes. you're more into carving. That's your finish. Hmm. For sure. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> this week. <laughs> Sean O'Neill. Has a question. Sh Shannon, a while back, you took a poll slash asked a question to the hand tool school community about our favorite era slash style of furniture. What is yours? Mm. <laughs> Queen Anne, probably. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's so hard to answer, though. I mean, uh, see, the, the problem, I, I love Queen Anne because I also just like the era. Um, and one of the things that really got me into hand tools was the historical aspect of it all. Um, you know, it, it, one trip to Colonial Williamsburg was enough to put me over the edge. And, and <laughs> Williamsburg lives firmly in the colonial Queen Anne or the neat and plain style. Um, walking around Williamsburg, I see a thousand pieces that I want to build. The great curse is it doesn't match my house at all. <laughs> Um, like I have built some Queen Anne pieces that I've ended up selling. Um, some I've given away because there's just no place for it in my house. It just doesn't fit. I live in a 1960s, very kind of mid century style house. So it doesn't fit. Yeah. 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 There's I, no high boys will fit in this house. <laughs> I barely fit sometimes. My shop ceiling is just under eight feet. So yeah, it's, I, I love the line. Um, in the simplicity of it, you know, the, the contrast to that would be like the Chippendale style go, you know, 20 years into the future, very massive, very intimidating, very intricately carved, um, very Baroque. And Queen Anne is all about the line. It's all about the delicate nature. You look at a cabriole leg from the Queen Anne period, and it's got a tiny, thin little ankle. And it's all about that Sima curve, you know, into a slipper foot. Um, it's, it's very um, elegant is a good way to put it. Um, but, you know, then out of the other side of my, out of the other side of my head, I'll go, oh, but you know, classic stickly is fantastic. There's something about that, like almost barbaric nature of big, heavy posts and, and slats. So I, I think, yeah, it's hard to choose one, but if I, you know, if I were forced to say, you must build in this style from here on out, it's probably going to be Queen <laughs> Anne. Um, but therein also lies some of my fascination with things like Scandinavian uh, mid-century, because that is really a postmodern embracing of the same ideals of the Queen Anne period. Very minimalist, very delicate, um, and all about the line. You know, when you think of, of, of 
uh, why are, why are Scandinavian designers suddenly leaving my brain? Um, Wegner, um, Eames wasn't Scandinavian, but in the same style, it's very minimalist and it's all about the shape and the line that they create. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the modern realization of the Queen Anne period. Interesting. Why don't you spend the next hour talking about furniture styles? I'm game. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was thinking, you know, I, I immediately go towards like the mission style, but uh -huh. not quite that simple. Um, you know, because I, I like having a little bit of a curve in there. I like having mm -hmm. a little bit of a, a little bit of Limber. carving. And so then I start thinking like green and green with a little yeah. bit like a Japanese feel almost. I was going to say, now you're getting into Asian influence. Yeah, and um, so I whole always, other thing pulling a little bit from this and that because there's never anything that's quite like, yeah, I could live in this because there's, everything has a little bit that I want. Right. But see, that's one of the things that's fascinating to me about the arts and crafts styles. It, it's a school of design with like a thousand subdivisions. Yeah. Like the, the Cotswold style of arts and crafts looks nothing like Stickley. And Limbert, you know, is very different than, than Stickley. And you get into, um, especially just British arts and crafts. Ruskin was, was had his own... Mm -hmm. Um, a unique style as well. Um, who's the guy? Uh, um, Macintosh, um, Frank Lloyd Wright, the whole prairie style. I mean, you, you just think about it. Technically, it's all arts and crafts, but prairie was totally different from green and green. And the influences were totally different. Green and green is fascinating um, from an architectural standpoint. Their ability to carry a theme throughout yeah. is so fascinating to me. Um, but let's be real. It was all about the Hall brothers. The Green brothers were just scribbling stuff on cocktail napkins, and the Hall brothers were like, "Okay, crap. How are we going to do this? Make this thing. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to do this little indent in the foot? Because you know the Green boys, they want it done nine hundred times in this bungalow. So let's figure out how to make this work. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fascinating. Um, who's the other one? I'm thinking. Oh, Beardsley um, in the Cotswold style. Totally different look and feel. I mean, look at um, like hayrick tables. It's got that. Um, almost brutalist nature of, of heavy arts and crafts, but it's so delicate at the same time. It's really fascinating. Like I said, you got an hour. Let's talk for anything. There's <laughs> a hot well, button for me. We're not going to make it through all the, the questions. So if anyone has anything particular they want, throw up a super chat. Otherwise, we'll get as far as we can tonight. But, uh, what do we got next? Ask him in the order I pulled them. So Carol's. Good speech. question, by the way, Sean, hand tool school member. <laughs> Carol's Cake says, okay, Sarah is your student. She just walked in. What is the first tool you introduce her to? Um, generally the first. <laughs> I'm at it. Just go. Here's a block of wood. Here's an ads. Have some fun. That would probably Sorry, be a James. cross cut saw here. Let's, let's practice cutting. Slice a board to length, slice a board to width. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, interestingly enough, like I said, that would be the one tool that I would choose because I do think it is the most versatile tool. Um, there's, but there's since you said that, I yeah. say, I say a chisel might be a good idea too. Kind of dangerous though. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first tool, but that in and of itself can be a valuable lesson, um, as, yeah. as a first tool. The bevel um, up, bevel down. How do you handle yeah. it? There's, there's because I mean, it, isn't it from that? Yeah. It's the original woodworking tool, right? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. the original, it's original any tool. Stone tool, I mean, stone carvers use chisels as well. I mean, saws are nothing but a bunch of chisels. Everything ends up being a chisel. It's like we used to always torment the instrumentalist back in my music career. We used to torment all the instrumentalists and say, you do realize you're just mimicking the human voice, right? Boy, that pissed him off. I really didn't like that. Yeah, Especially the oboe players. Somebody with it. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on the note you hit. You beat somebody's <laughs> submission with the right note. But no, I, I think I think since you said saw, I would go with chisel. Um, and I have done that in the past. Um, when I was uh, volunteering at the Stepping Stone Museum, we would often have um, school tours that would come through. And from the older kids that would come through, we would often break them off into small groups and we would give them a, you know, that was one of the cool things that they got to be hands-on with tools. And we had several... Um, chisels that were dull um, and chisels that were sharpened. It's kind of like, um, <laughs> yes. you know, uh, it is certainly a dull chisel could cause a lot more harm, but learning how to hold it and feel the balance and working it, pairing it bevel down 
was best done using a dull chisel. They weren't going to just slice themselves open if they looked at it incorrectly. And then you, you, you got the, the feel of it and the weight of it and understanding what it means to be working with the bevel down and the bevel up, um, how to push it, how to use your, your whole body to, to, to pair with it. And then we could switch to, you know, an actual sharpened tool and, and learn quite a bit from that. There's also, I think a little bit more tactile feedback, like, as you cut the yeah. wood, yeah. you can feel the fibers parting or feel the fibers cutting as you're cutting across the grain more than you can with a saw. You're a little yeah. bit more detached there. And I think but another yeah, thing I, dangerous. I might say is, especially with kids, is I like to give them a spoke shave. Because a oh, you know, yeah. properly set up flat bottom spoke shave, any monkey can run one of those. It doesn't take much force Wouldn't you want my children? What's that? <laughs> yes, because I mean, it doesn't take much force at all to do that, but you still get to learn grain direction with it, and the curls coming off it are just something that everyone falls in love with. That's true. It's, it's a good way to really suck someone into the art quickly without much fuss. Work for me, folks. Yeah. See the, the, see the Renaissance Woodworker logo up there? It is yeah. a spoke shave, because that was the tool that did it. Lights out. First time I used a spoke shave, it was like, screw these power tools. I'm yeah. using hand tools from now on. Good old spoke shave. Good What's answer. It? All right, let's see. Jay Howe asked, I don't think that reducing to one tool, but the more practical question would be how minimal a number slash variety of tools would be acceptable and still produce most anything in your shop? A jack plane, a crosscut saw, a half inch chisel, a quarter inch chisel, square but you could build that with the first four tools yeah um but yeah bit. you're going to need a square at some point um no i'm not even going to say a square since you could build it mm -hmm. you know i'm not going to say a marking gauge either because you could build that a so you got you build that or grab a stick <laughs> yeah that's what i did in my in my orientation semester i was like we could build a mallet but here's a hunk of four by four and i just yeah. used it for the entire semester so we got a plane a saw and two chisels I specifically say, what did I say? Quarter inch and half inch? Yeah. No. Yeah. Half inch and quarter inch. That would be good. Although I could amend that and say, get yourself like a one inch chisel and a quarter inch chisel and you'd be a little bit more capable, but very little that I could not build with that. Um, yeah, you I know, if you're able to get your hands on nicely sawn lumber, um, you could go straight to a back saw like a joinery saw, um, a carcass saw would be the, the, the choice there, but um, you're still going to have to break parts down to size. So I think a carcass saw, or excuse me, a, a crosscut saw mm -hmm. is a good choice there. But that was what, four tools. So adding a fifth one and saying a good carcass saw would certainly make joinery a lot easier. Um, you can cut tenons all day long with a full size crosscut saw, but a joinery saw is going to make it a little bit easier. So that's five tools, I think. Yeah, I think the only other thing I would have would probably be a brace and bit. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I actually, that was yeah. one of the things, when I made my first video on beginner tools, um, I went through them in order that I actually bought them, and come to find out the brace mm -hmm. and bit was actually a long ways down the line. Because yeah. there's a lot of projects out there you don't have to drill a hole for. No, I mean, primarily the reason I use my brace and bit is for boring mortises. Um, yeah. You know, when I'm not chopping out a mortise, I will bore it out. Um, and if I'm, if I'm doing through mortises, I always bore them. Uh, I just find it to be so much faster uh, to do it that way. But yeah, the majority of what I'm using the brazen bit for is something to do with a mortise. Um, it's rare that I'm boring a round hole, you yeah. know. Uh, it's usually you only get to draw bores and stuff later. Yeah, yeah. And even then, that's using my egg beater drill more than anything else. You know, a smaller bit. Um, so yeah, you, you're right. Um, I think it was quite a while down the road um, before I had a, a brace in a bit. Is that a super chat, babe? Yes, Alan's being cheeky. He <laughs> said, can Sarah operate a spoke shave asking for a friend? <laughs> you better watch it, Alan. She's hunting you down. You really, <laughs> she's coming out to Utah next week. <laughs> I have a certain set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> you do that in your current Don't have time for one or two more? Uh, okay. Um, okay, we've talked a lot about the particular tools that you would use. I'm just looking through real quick. 
Okay. Um, Alex G asked, question for both. Has your toolkit become more complicated or less complicated over time? For example, are there tasks you used to do with a specialty tool, tool that you now knock out with a chisel, et cetera? No doubt. Absolutely. Um, I've always referred to it as the optimization of my toolkit. Um, this cabinet, which is closed behind us, um, used to, it, there's no way I could have fit my tools in that before. Um, I do a lot more with a lot less planes. Um, I have very few specialty tools. Um, I have a, a I don't even have a full set of hollows and rounds anymore. Um, I have a, I have a half set of hollows and rounds. Um, and I have a couple of complex molding planes because I really like that particular profile and I use it a lot. Um, but I would much rather make all of my moldings with the basic hollows and rounds. Um, used to have side escapement planes, gimmick, got rid of them. You know, I, if I need to widen a dado, I will plane down the male part of the joint, not widen the female part of the joint. Um, I have a couple of dado planes, rarely use them. I have them because they're kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but I would much rather cut a dado with a saw and a chisel and, and a router plane. Um, I used to use the dado planes a lot for that. Um, used to have a bunch of shoulder planes, got rid of all of them. I do that with, you know, a chisel most of the time. Um, the rabbit plane, as in the wooden rabbit plane, I think is probably the most universal tool I have in my shop. I use it constantly from tuning joinery to actually cutting rabbits, go figure. Um, it's, and it's a block of wood and a block of wood for the wedge and a blade. It's the simplest tool ever. Um, so yeah, there, I have sold more tools, more hand tools than I own most definitely, um, by like <laughs> maybe an order of magnitude, um, bought and sold off many, many more. My toolkit is a, is a, a shadow of what it used to be. I think the first one that comes to mind for me is my, my compass planes. I have, I have two of them up here on the wall. And if I need to cut an arch, I'm going to saw down to the line and chisel it out and then clean it with a spoke shave. Spoke shave. Because I find that to be far more enjoyable than pulling those out. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, they're probably going to be a little faster. But you know, maybe it's the fun of it and just being able to do something freehand. Just yeah, if you've got a really long shape. curve, a really long, gentle curve, the compass plane is really nice for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great way to fare a curve, but I will still shape it with the spoke shave. You know, it's that game of coarse, medium, and fine, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I will saw it with, with a turning saw or a bow saw of some sort, usually clean it up with a spoke shave and then come in with the compass plane for like six passes just to fare everything nice and smooth and, and consistent. I have to say, though, I've gone the other way when it comes to shooting. <laughs> is since I got in the uh, the the uh, uh, the fifty one, um, I love this thing. This is this 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 because shooting was something I used to only pull out when I needed to do it for a video and show someone how to shoot. Every other time, I just freehand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but since I got this, I now pull out the shooting board rather than freehanding it. I would agree with that. I went the same way, and I fought it for a long time. I was like, I got a, I got a jack plane. That's fine. And then I, um, I finally screwed an outboard guide on that trapped my, my jack plane in the shoot on the shooting board. Mm -hmm. And it was like this, why haven't I done this like 10 years ago? Yeah. And then it was from there, honestly, to be, to be perfectly honest, it was Tigo vote. Like it's a little devil on my shoulder whispering in my ear, telling me you need to have one of those shooting planes. They're total game changers, you know? And here's a guy that, you know, he sells shooting boards. So obviously he goes to a lot of shows and shoots stuff all day long, you know, eight, nine hours that the show floor is open. He's sitting there shooting things all day long. And when he says, this is kind of a big deal, like Tico has shot more wood <laughs> than anyone on the planet probably. And he's like, you know, I don't care what you do. Get a vintage one, get a Lee Nielsen one, get a Lee Valley one, get one. They're, they are game changers. I will. I will agree. I've I've referred to it as a game changer a couple of times before. And and you're right. I end up using the shooting board a lot more than I used to, because of that. Got time for one more, babe? Uh sure. Um, let's see. Knowledge Quest asks, Have you or do you use hide glue, and what are the pros and cons? <laughs> I'll let um, you take this one. <laughs> um, yes, I do. Um, I have. I will always. Um, I have 
well, let's put it this way. I have a bottle of Type Bond 2 that is so far out of date that it probably should be in a museum. Um, definitely not something that should get used. Hide glue, um, let's see. Let's first talk about why people don't want to use it. Um, they think, well, it's reversible, so it's weak. Um, or B, it's weak or, or weaker than modern PVAs. Um, it's a pain in the butt because you got to mix it and you got to heat it up. Um, none of that really is true. Right. Um, high glue, first of all, high glue is thousands of years old. And some of that furniture is still together. It's still hanging on. Um, high glue is infinitely reusable. So if you, um, it's funny, as I said earlier in the hand tool school, we have a joke. I've got a video for that. I've got multiple videos for this where we actually walk through mixing high glue, mixing it to proportions, however you want to use it. And then when you're done with it, I dump it out on a piece of wax paper and let it dry. Um, Cause when it's dried, it can sit on a shelf for a thousand years. And then you can take it down, break it up into pieces, put some water over top of it and heat it up and use it again. It does not lose its strength no matter how many times you do that. It's the same animal protein. That's what glues things together. So because of that infinite reusability, it's always able to be reactivated. So if you screw up, you can reactivate it. But people think, well, that could be a problem. It's not easy to reactivate this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like it takes a lot of heat and a lot of water, a lot of both in order to reactivate it. If the joint itself is a well-fit joint, first of all, A, why do you need to reverse that? Like what has gone so wrong that you have to take that apart? Like I've never reversed yeah. a glued together mortise and tenon high glue joint. That would be really hard, like a blind, not a through tenon, like a blind mortise. I'm not exactly sure how I would get would water, water in there, in there to reverse it, but why would I reverse that anyway? Like if you screwed up that badly that you have to reverse it, you might just cut it off and start over. <laughs> um, you know, in, in a well-fit joint, why do you reverse joints? Because you're repairing it because it failed. Well, if it failed, then you probably can get water and heat in there to reverse it. And if you can, you can take it apart. You can remove that glue simply by just wiping it down with a hot rag. The glue will come off and you've got a clean tenon again that can be tweaked, that can be added onto. You can glue a cheek back on and recut it to kind of fatten up that tenon to fit the mortise, apply high glue and glue it back together. Um, you can alter the consistency or the viscosity of the high glue in order to match whatever you want to do. So um, the lower the viscosity, um, you know, the, the runnier it is, um, it's going to change its open time. So a lot of people say, well, I don't like high glue because the open time is so short. Well, A, with something like um, hammer veneering, that's what this hammer veneer is. If I'm, you know, uh, doing marketry and gluing everything in place, I want super fast tack on that. So I'll create a, 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 a runnier um, solution of high glue, a, a, a lower viscosity high glue that is specifically going to tack up faster um, and allow me to press my marketing pieces in place and you know hold it for a couple of seconds and then it's good, it begins to tack up. Or I can increase the viscosity and increase the open time. Um, liquid high glue is, is a more viscous version of high glue that also has um, urea added to it, which allows it to keep it liquid at, at room temperature. But you know it will still gel up at lower temperatures. The urea is essentially lowering that, that tack point. You can't really do that with PVA. If you dilute PVA, yeah. you dilute its strength. You can dilute high glue so much and it still doesn't change its strength because the glue itself is the protein. Now, if you dilute it really, really low, you're just putting less protein over the surface. Um, but if it's a good joint to begin with, you don't need much, right? In fact, a lot of times too much glue can cause a bit of a problem in a joint. So to me, the number one thing is that infinite reusability. There is a shelf life to liquid high glue. Don't get me wrong. When you add urea to it, you start to break down the chemical bonds that, that allow that infinite, um, infinite shelf life of, of hot high glue. Um, if you keep your high glue hydrated, um, one second. Visual aids. 
So you have jars, what looks like collagen, but it's not. This is a soft tissue complex, great for um, putting in your recovery shakes after a long run. <laughs> um, so we have high glue, which is, this is ground into these little grains. Um, this has no shelf life. This is perfectly dry um, and you don't have to worry about it molding or anything like that because there's no moisture in it. This can sit on a shelf for a thousand years and be used. Um, when I take these, I dump them into a container and I add water so that it starts to gel. So I've got kind of goop in the bottom of this. Um, I could scoop this goop out um, and it will dry out and it will dry into a rock hard texture. Um, this would take a very long time to dry out because it's, it's a good two inches thick in the bottom there. Plus I close it up and keep it kind of sort of airtight. This would, this would probably mold you know, in a couple of months. Um, I will go through this much faster than that. Um, so this has some hydration in it, but if I take it out and let it dry, let all that moisture evaporate out, it again is infinitely usable. The risk you have in keeping it hydrated for long periods of time is something like mold could grow, um, which is why uh, I say like, if I'm finished with my high glue um, for a while, I'll dump it out dump it out of the pot onto something like wax paper, or if you have one of those like cool silicone rockler mats or whatever, go rockler. You, um, you know, it spreads it out thinner so that it dries quicker and the moisture evaporates quicker and you just peel it up and you've got this hard brick that you just put on a shelf or whatever. That's just really cool. The ability to not have to worry, you know, about your glue going bad. Um, and it's super, super quick and easy to, to rehydrate and heat up. Um, and on top of that, the the test I done the test I done the test I did was actually showing that it had a slightly higher um, gap filling capability than most PVAs. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, it's so transparent it to finish as, as well. To... That's that's the other thing. Totally transparent yeah. to finish. Not yeah. totally. If you've got a big clump of it, you know, it's going <laughs> to show up. But you know, the 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 OCD that we have developed, like making sure all of the glue is out of the joint because you don't want it to show up in the finish later. It's not an issue. High glue is completely transparent to that stuff. It's not going to show up, um, which is pretty awesome because you know, I spent I spent a lot less time scraping the inside corners of aprons with a mortise and tendon joint because it's just not that big of a deal. The other cool thing is, is say you do have a clump of high glue there. You take a, a paper towel with hot water on it, rub it over it, and the high glue's gone. It's completely gone. Can't do that with PVA once it's yeah. cured. So yeah. <laughs> I see no reason not to use high glue. I see lots of reasons not to use PVA and epoxy and CA. It's not that I don't use that. I mean, any turner worth his weight has a bunch of CA glue floating around. Um, epoxy certainly has its merits for, especially when I'm gluing like metal to wood and things like that. Um, yeah, I, when it comes to woodworking, I use nothing but high glue now. I see, I do probably about, uh... Actually, I think I'm pretty close to even when it comes to PVA, high glue, epoxy, and CA. I, I use them all just about the same, actually. Just kind of weird. You call <laughs> yourself a hand to a woodworker. <laughs> Poser. I was actually just putting together uh, Matt Cremona's chair kit today. Um, and I chose to do them with epoxy. Wow. <laughs> Probably use wire nails too. Jeez. <laughs> How'd you know? Have you met our children? <laughs> <laughs> They're beavers. Cool. I think we've uh, wasted enough of your good time. So uh, thank you everyone for coming. I want to say a huge thank you to Shannon. It's fun. Um, if you want to see all of his stuff, I have links to it down in the description down below. Or go to uh, handtoolschool.net or uh, the... Um, the Renaissance. Blah, 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 blah. Here, why don't you tell us where you're at? <laughs> RenaissanceWoodworker.com or <laughs> LumberUpdate.com. I'm there too. Sometimes I'm over at WoodTalk.com too. I think. Cool. Is it WoodTalk.com? I should know that. I do the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. So, yeah, no, this, this is a lot of fun. I like hanging out and talking shop. Yeah. We'll have to do it again sometime. So, Absolutely. we'll have, uh, I don't know who we're having on next month. Oh, it's Matt. Matt Cremona, of course. The other one from Word Talk. 
Nice. That should be fun. <laughs> so we'll uh, talk about his arboretum. Yeah. His, his, uh, I think his it's going to be his hair. Yeah. <laughs> <Compared to> James. <laughs> So next week, um, I don't know if we're going to be doing it, but if we do, it'll probably be Monday night um, because we might actually be out in Utah with Alan. So we might be doing a live with him, but we'll see and play that by ear. So uh, follow the socials and we'll let everyone know when it will be. But uh, I think that'll about do it. So thanks, Shannon. And until thank next time, guys. have a wonderful night. See y'all. Bye.